Good evening. Welcome to the gathering at Scott Memorial Home Edition. This is Pastor Rachel coming to you live from my dining room table where my soon-to-be 10-year-old son, say hi Bennett, hi. is working on some um, Minecraft Legos there. Ah. So um, he's going to be chilling out while I preach. Uh, there's a lot of exciting stuff going on at the gathering. We have the longest night uh, prayer vi or the longest night memorial service for the homeless happening this Friday evening at 7 p.m. at the new HRC on Wichita Road. So if you want to be a part of that, if you want to buy some underwear or some thermals, some long johns to give to our brothers and sisters experiencing homelessness, please drop them off any day this week before Thursday when the office closes so that we can deliver those on Friday night. If you want to help us and assist in handing out our d'oeuvres and cookies after the uh, memorial service on Friday, we'd love to have your help too. So just post your interest below and I'll get with you with the details. All right, so we are continuing our sermon series based on Adam Hamilton's book called The Journey. And today we're talking a little bit more about the relationship between um, Elizabeth and Mary. But to know about the relationship between Elizabeth and Mary, we need to look first at who Elizabeth was. She was married to a guy named Zachariah and they'd been married for decades and decades and they struggled with something that many couples today struggle with and that's infertility. So um, according to a Huffington Post article that came out last year, one in eight couples will struggle with infertility issues, which means that it takes them um, six months up to a year to get pregnant uh, or to remain pregnant without having some type of miscarriage. And so this is something that is much more common than we're willing to acknowledge or discuss. And there's uh, someone named Sarah Prager who is the associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology and the director of family planning at the University of Washington School of Medicine in Seattle who says, you know, up to a third of women will experience a miscarriage at some point in their lives. So this is a common issue and yet we don't talk about it. There's a stigma attached to it. And as much as there is a stigma now or shame attached to it, which there shouldn't be, and we should grieve and be able to be open together about this loss and this struggle. Um, back in Jesus' day, it was a huge issue as well. You needed children. You needed free labor uh, when you were trying to make ends meet and had to work the farm or train someone in a craft. And so the fact that Elizabeth and Zechariah couldn't have kids was really difficult for them. So after decades and decades, Zechariah, while he's lighting in incense in the temple, the angel Gabriel appears and says, okay, it's time. You're, you're going to have a kid. We know that Elizabeth and Zechariah were really good people. In Luke 1, 6, it tells us both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. So they're good people. And the angel arrives with good news saying, you're going to have a baby. And it's not just any baby. In Luke 1, verses 14 to 17, it says, He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. They would have a baby boy and he would grow up to be John the Baptist. And many people don't realize John the Baptist and Jesus are connected not only because they both preached about repentance and, and reconnection to God, but also because they were actually related by blood. Elizabeth and Mary were relatives. And so when Mary hears that she's going to be pregnant and give birth to God's son, she goes to visit Elizabeth, who is further along in her pregnancy. And as soon as she shows up and walks in the room, Elizabeth knows something big is happening. In Luke 1, 42 to 45, it says, Blessed are you among women. So I want to, before I dive into this passage, it's really important to note, and Adam Hamilton mentions that the word um, blessed appears three times in these four verses. So blessed are you among women. Blessed is the child that you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And I think this is important for us to talk about a little bit because I, I don't know about you, I was at the, um, out at a Christmas festival here in town and they were selling t-shirts that said blessed, you know, and what does it mean to truly be blessed? There's this whole movement called the prosperity gospel that says if you're good, if you're righteous, like Elizabeth and Zachariah were, like Mary was, if, if you are a holy person, then you will have health and wealth. Life will be easy. Life will be good. You will have all that you need and then some. And yet we read in the text today that although Elizabeth and Zachariah did what was right, they were righteous in the sight of the Lord, they struggled for 
decades and decades with their health to have a baby. That's all they wanted was to be parents. Their life wasn't easy. Mary was holy and pure of virgin carrying the Son of God, and her life was not easy. She's an unwed pregnant mother who doesn't know how she's going to pay for her kid or what she's going to do or if she's going to be stoned by her town. So she was facing a lot of stress. And so sometimes um, we are blessed and our life is good and we have so much to be grateful for. And it's okay to be happy and celebrate at those good times. But um, all of us will experience seasons in our life that are not easy, that are not good. The world is not kind. We're, we experience pain or we struggle. And in those moments, we can still be blessed, not because of our external circumstances, but because of our internal ones. Because in our heart, we know who God is and we seek the love and joy and comfort and peace and power of a God who will sustain us through any storm that comes our way. And so Mary was blessed, not because her life was easy, but because she had the kind of relationship with God that she could lean into when times got tough. And so it, uh, something Adam Hamilton talks about in his chapter on the relationship between Elizabeth and Mary is that Elizabeth served as kind of a mentor for Mary to help her with this uncertain news. And by calling her blessed, by reminding her of how God was at work, it allowed Mary to do something that we haven't seen her do in scripture to this point. It allowed Mary to, to respond with joy. And we have these really powerful words that are called the Magnificat based on the first few words in English uh, translated into Latin. Uh, as Mary responds and cries out, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name. I love this because it's a reminder that um, sometimes we feel invisible. Sometimes we feel like we aren't good enough or don't have enough to be part of God's big and magnificent plan. But Mary came from lowly humble origins and God saw her and used her in powerful ways and God can use you too. Uh, she goes on to say his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation and uh, I remind my kids from time to time that to be afraid of uh, to fear God doesn't mean to be afraid of God or scared of God but to be in awe or reverence of who God is to say you know what God you and the things that you care about are a priority to me because you matter so much and I want to grow, grow closer to you and I know a way to do that is by honoring and respecting who you are and what you're about um, so she goes on to say he's shown strength with his arm he has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts he has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly he has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich empty away. Now my favorite part of Adam Hamilton's chapter from this book is where he really reflects on the fact that by virtue of being born in America, and especially in Virginia Beach or Kansas where Adam Hamilton is from, so many of us are actually easier, uh, can more easily identify with what it means to be the rich that God sends away empty than those who are truly hungry that God fills with good things. So what do we do with that? What do we do about that this time of year? Well, Adam Hamilton says, and I quote from this book, so what does Mary's song mean for the rich? I see her words as an invitation. It's an invitation for us to humble ourselves before God and to be used by God to fulfill the first words of that line, to help the poor walk away full. I'm called to share my resources and to pass along the blessings I've received in seeking to bless and encourage and lift up other people. They are sent away full and I discover what it means to be blessed. Um, I love that he mentions all the time and energy we spend trying to find the perfect gift for people who really don't need anything else. So what do we do? How do we focus this time of year on not, um, not sending the poor hungry away, but feeding them, filling them. And what I love about being a part of the gathering at Scott Memorial United Methodist Church is you guys are just doing a phenomenal job with this. So many churches have to raise money time and time again to do any types of outreach. But because you give every Sunday, you just put money in the offering plate, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars from our regular Sunday morning offering goes into a mission fund so that when we, we wanna buy a bus pass for all 60 of the individuals experiencing homeless 
homelessness who will wake up in our church on Christmas morning. We want to get them all a bus pass. That's a little under $400. We didn't have to ask you for that money because you give generously every Sunday to our general fund. So we have the means to allocate to reach out and to help those in need. Um, so when people need help with a utility bill or when someone needs to be put up in a hotel for a night or when someone needs food, all of that is at our disposal because you are so generous and do such incredible and amazing things. If you were in worship today, we took a picture of all the presents that you purchased for the kids at Cook Elementary School, all the food. You guys realize in less than two weeks, people stepped up. We are not a massive church, but we have more than enough food to feed 60 men and women from December 22nd through December 28th for breakfast, for dinners. It's been amazing to see the outpouring of your love, ensuring that the poor do not go away hungry at the gathering at Scott Memorial United Methodist Church. So um, I'm going to push you and challenge you uh, before I close because we got some other good news this past week. Our permit has been approved. So construction, renovation, a mass chaos will ensue in our building starting January 6th. So December will be our last month in the sanctuary and then we'll all move into the fellowship hall. It'll be cozy. It'll be beautiful starting in January. But we do have around $13,000 left to raise in our More Than Bricks campaign. And when you donate to this really important cause to help secure that these renovations happen and are done right and in a timely manner, when you donate in that way, it ensures that the hundreds I kid you not, hundreds of people that come to our church every single week to be fed will not go away hungry. So help us make this church space safe and inclusive and ready to minister to our community for decades and generations and generations to come. Um, thank you so much for all you do, for all the ways you give. Together, guys, we can do extraordinary things. So may we remember this story of Mary, who was blessed not because life was easy, but because she knew she was going to be faithful to God's plan and God would be with her every step of the way. God saw her and would be with her no matter what happened. Um, and may we seek to look at our resources, not trying to add more gifts to people who really don't need anything else but to truly give to those who need it most. Um, have an awesome week and join us on Sunday for the kids pageant. It will be an event to remember at 9 a.m. 10:15 next Sunday, the 23rd at the gathering at Scott Memorial UMC. Have a great night guys. Bye.